So, good evening. My name is Fanjin. A lot of people call me FJ. And I am a software engineer at MetaMarkets. So, tonight I want to talk to you guys about an open source project that I work on, and it's called Druid. So, a brief overview of some of the things I'll cover tonight. Uh, I'll just do a brief demo of a product that's been built on top of Druid to really motivate some of the problems that Druid is meant to solve. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the history behind Druid and why we decided to build our own data store and why we decided to open source it. And then I'll go into a little bit of the high level architecture behind the project where I'll try and explain what's going on with a bunch of pictures and arrows and whatnot. And then finally, I'll talk about the state of the community right now, what we're planning to do, and how we hope to grow things. Okay, so to really understand Druid, um, we found it best to really show off like, a product that's been built on top of Druid. And that product is the MetaMarkets dashboard. So let's see if you guys can see this here. So this is not meant to be like a sales uh, pitch or anything like that. Um, just trying to showcase the technology. Uh, this dashboard that you actually see here is visualizing edits as they're occurring on Wikipedia. So hopefully everyone here is familiar with Wikipedia. There's a lot of pages, a lot of cool content on Wikipedia, and anyone can go and edit a page. Basically what happens is when you edit a page, an event gets generated in an IRC channel that we scrape and dump into Druid. Uh, this event is composed of several different like pieces of information. So one piece is a timestamp indicating like when the edit occurred. Uh, some other pieces are metadata or attributes about the page that was edited or the person who was doing the edit and like where that person resides. And there's a bunch of metrics associated with the edit as well. So like the number of characters that were added or the number of characters that were deleted. So what this dashboard is basically showing is how edits are occurring on Wikipedia over some span of time. So in the top left there, you can see edits as they're trending across time. You can see the number of unique users that were doing edits at any time. And you can have an idea of like the number of characters added, removed, and how many how many of the edits were done by robots? There's a lot of bots on Wikipedia. <laughs> so um, you can do more things on this dashboard, like you can actually filter down and drill down uh, based on metrics that you care about. So for example, you, if you want to say, if you want to see you know, how many edits were done by people in the United States, you can drill down. And you can do things like how many people, you know, what are the top edited pages in San Francisco. So I just did two filters there, one for country United States, the other for city San Francisco. And we can look at the top edited pages, and I don't really know what the first one is. Um, Jimbo Wales is getting a lot of edits, which is pretty cool, and there's uh, some other stuff on there, the 49er season. Uh, I don't watch sports at all, but I know a lot of people do, so. <laughs> um, and some other things you can do on this dashboard, you can like compare how different edits are trending across time. You can zoom in on different time granularities. So we can see how edits are <coughs> trending on an hourly or minutely or hourly basis. And it's kind of hard to see on this dashboard, but we are actually ingesting events in so-called real time. So as people are editing pages on Wikipedia, or if you want to edit a page on Wikipedia right now, we should be able, we should be able to ingest it and see it in this dashboard. So. So the dashboard is really a showcase of like what we try and build here at MetaMarkets. Uh, MetaMarkets is not a social media company. We actually build like analytics dashboards for the advertising technology space. But um, a lot of the problems that we try and solve and a lot of the problems that Druid is meant to solve span many different industries. 
So when you're given a lot of event data, so for example, this could be data that gets generated every time someone edits a page on Wikipedia. You have your timestamp column, you have the page that was edited, you have some different you have some different dimensions about that edit, and you have a set of you have a set of metrics about the edit. <coughs> and what we want to do with this type of data is we're trying to answer questions like, you know, how many edits occurred in San Francisco over the last week, or what were the top edited pages in English over the last hour. So fundamentally, what we're doing is we're just adding numbers. We're adding numbers to add que to answer questions. And when we add numbers, we can apply certain, we can add numbers over a certain time range, or we can add numbers where a certain set of filters is applied. So you're probably thinking, you know, why are you building this like crazy complex system uh, just to add numbers? And the real, real problem is that when a data set gets sufficiently large enough, the problem of adding numbers becomes very difficult. Like that process can dramatically slow down. Um, and this is a problem that's like commonly solved in the so-called like data warehousing space. So Druid, uh, Druid as a system is really catered to do, really catered to solve three problems. Um, one is around this idea of data exploration. When you load data into Druid, what we want to be able to do with that data is arbitrarily explore the data and slice and dice and drill down, and drill down into that data. Um, sort of another key problem that Druid is meant to solve is around latencies of data ingestion. So Druid is meant to ingest data without much overhead and as quickly as possible. And finally, uh, Druid is designed to be a production quality system. So it has quite a few HA characteristics built in. Uh, in the early days of MetaMarkets, you know, we didn't really have an operations team. So we need to build a system that had to be highly available and it had to be up even if we weren't because we really didn't want to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning to debug like different issues that could happen. So Druid is very much designed for this environment where you know failures in your system are like a very common and everyday occurrence, and it has to be like available and reliable enough to handle those different types of failures. So uh, MetaMarkets was founded in 2010, and you know in the early days of the company, we knew that like we had this dashboard that we want to be able to deliver to our clients. So we want our clients to be able to arbitrarily explore their data sets, whatever they may be. Uh, what we didn't know was what was the engine that we could use to like, power this dashboard. Like what could we do to you know, interactively explore data? And what we tried initially is, I think, what a lot of different companies try. Uh, we tried to power a dashboard with a relational database. If you're familiar with relational databases like MySQL and Postgres, you know, they've been around for quite a while and their benefits are like extremely well documented, they're extremely well known. And even to this day, like relational databases remain a common solution to be like a data engine. And it, it's still a common solution to the data warehousing problem. Um, the typical setup that you would do with a relational database is you have a star schema, you have some aggregate tables, and then you have a query cache. And, and this setup is really meant to maximize the performance of your queries. If you're not familiar with data warehousing, don't worry too much about this. Um, so the system that we actually tried using in the early days of the company was Postgres. And what we found with using Postgres was basically Queries that were cached, they were pretty fast. Um, queries that went against aggregate tables, like these special tables meant to speed, uh, speed up the time it takes to do aggregates. Uh, those queries were fast to acceptable. The queries that required scanning the base fact table, so queries that required going to your raw data and scanning that data, those were a little too slow. 
So some benchmarks. Uh, we benchmarked the scan rate of the Postgres system that we were using at about 5.5 million rows per second per core. And what this meant was, you know, a query over one week worth of data. It wasn't a lot of data. On a 16 core machine, it took about five seconds. Now, on a dashboard like the one I just demoed before, well, that every time you do a click on that dashboard, every time you load that dashboard, it generates about 20 to 40 concurrent queries. And on a system, and when you issue those queries on a system like Postgres, the page load really took like an order of minutes, and that was just too slow for an interactive experience. So, okay, so we decided, okay, maybe Postgres isn't the right solution for us. Uh, what else is out there? What else is available? And the time frame I'm kind of talking about here is maybe early 2011. And in early 2011, a very common solution was to use NoSQL key value stores. You know, NoSQL was sort of up and coming. It was like the new kid on the block. Everyone was, you know, it was like all the rage and everyone was, you know, talking about it. But our experiences were, with NoSQL were less than great. Um, popular NoSQL solutions include like Cassandra and HBase, and there's like many others. Uh, we actually ended up trying HBase. And what we saw with uh, NoSQL key value stores was the limitations in how you could use them. So for example, let's say you have a very simple data set on the left here, okay? You have a timestamp column, you have a gender and age dimension, and then you have a revenue, you have a revenue metric. So if you wanted to be able to arbitrarily explore this data set and query you know, without limit, how you would have to use a key value store is basically you have to pre-compute out every single possible query that someone can make. So for example, with timestamp equals to one here, you create an entry in your key value store, timestamp one, and then your revenue is the sum of those three rows there. Similarly, if you wanted to know um, what your revenue was when timestamp equals one or gender equals female, then you're creating an entry in your key value store, timestamp one, gender female, and then your revenue is the sum of the last two rows there. So it's very easy to see that if you want to be able to arbitrarily explore this data set, you basically have to generate out like all permutations of queries that your user can make. And that set of queries can get very large very quickly. Um, what we found with using HBase was queries are super fast if you pre-computed them because you basically just do a lookup. Um, the queries tended to be a little bit inflexible. Uh, if you didn't pre-compute something, basically it was not available. It was in your key value store. Uh, the data was not really continuously updated. It was hard to have incoming events and also do pre-computation on top of those incoming events. Um, but the, the biggest pain for us was around this processing time. Like the time it would take to calculate out every single possible query, that took way too long. So um, what we actually tried before completely abandoning this solution was we tried to limit uh, like the number of queries that our users could make. So this way, we would try and limit the number of things that we would be pre-computing. But even trying that didn't give us very great results. So uh, the benchmarks that we have here was basically on a data set that had half a million rows, so something incredibly tiny. Uh, this had had 11 dimensions, and we restricted the query set, and it took us 4.5 hours on a 15 node Hadoop cluster to basically pre-compute out everything. When that data set increased slightly, so our, our customers deliver, delivered a little bit more data, uh, when it increased to 14 dimensions, the Computation time took nine hours on a 25 node Hadoop cluster. So it was kind of around this time that we realized, you know, 
this is probably not the best way to go go about this. We're not gonna be able to scale. We're gonna go bankrupt in like a few weeks. So uh, we, we kind of went back to the space and we started looking, you know, what else is out there? What other open source solutions could we leverage? And we didn't really find very much. So we looked at what we learned with the two solutions that we tried and we realized the problem with relational database management systems were that scan speed just can, tended to be somewhat slow. The problem with NoSQL key value stores was uh, pre-computation time just took too long. And we kind of thought, you know, maybe it's not that hard, or maybe it's a little bit easier to solve the problems that we saw with relational database management systems. So around mid-2011-ish, we really started building out Druid. And Druid, uh, that's our logo, by the way. It's a little bit of work in progress right now. Um, <coughs> Druid is a distributed column-oriented uh, data store. And Druid is really built from the ground up uh, to be able to add numbers really, really quickly. Um, that was sort of the, the main use case that we had in the early days. Uh, what, what other things that Druid is kind of good for is this idea of being able to really zoom in and filter your data. So Druid has two levels of indexes to help you narrow down on, on uh, data that matches exactly your, query, uh, your filter set and only scan that data. Druid is designed to be highly available, so it's designed to be uh, in a, an environment where failures happen every day, and right now Druid powers a SaaS product. So, And sort of finally there, Druid is designed to be real-time, and uh, real-time is very much this buzzword that I think gets kind of thrown around in our space. It gets thrown around in the valley. It's like cloud or it's like big data. Everyone says they're doing it, but it's like very unclear what people are offering. So everyone wants it. Nobody knows what it is that people are actually offering. Um, to us uh, in Druid, we really measure real time based on two facets. One of those is on the rate of query return. So in Druid, uh, when you're scanning tables that comprise of billions and billions of rows, uh, we want our queries to be able to return in something less than five seconds. Uh, for most of our queries, the actual uh, query latency is less than one second. So the other side of real time is really about how fast uh, a system can ingest data. So if some event occurs, uh, how, soon, how fast can your system ingest that event and make it explorable? And in the Druid world, we try and make uh, event ingestion happen in something less than 10 seconds. In most real world case scenarios, uh, we actually do event ingestion on the order of hundreds of milliseconds. Okay, so the architecture of Druid. Um, I found it easy to describe the architecture of Druid in the context of a popular 90s television show, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And uh, the idea behind Mighty Morphin Power Rangers is basically uh, the good guys, whenever they fought the bad guys, would summon these like giant robots called Zords. And you know, when the bad guy got too hard to beat, the Zords would combine together into this giant fighting robot called the Megazord. And then the Megazord would beat the bad guy and the good guys would win, and, and the day is saved. So Druid kind of operates on a similar principle. A Druid cluster is comprised of different types of nodes, and each node is really specialized to do a certain set of things very well. A full Druid cluster, uh, basically these nodes come together and they form an, an entire system, and that system is meant to solve your your data analytics problems. So I'm gonna briefly go over some of the pieces of a Druid cluster. And the first piece that we start off with are real-time nodes. So real-time nodes 
they basically encompass the functionality to deal with event streams. Uh, Real-time nodes query, uh, they ingest data and make that data immediately queryable as soon as some event is ingested. And how they work at a very high level is they buffer data into memory and then periodically they build like an immutable representation of the data they've collected. And then they, they take that representation and they hand it off to something else in the Druid cluster, which is like more specialized in, doing, in dealing with immutable data. So real-time nodes only hold a small batch of incoming data. And where real-time nodes hand data off, off to is this idea of historical nodes. And historical nodes are sort of the main workhorses of a Druid cluster. Most of a Druid cluster is actually comprised of historical nodes. And historical nodes load immutable batches of data. And they're pretty dumb. They basically load data and then respond to queries for data. In front of the real-time nodes and historical nodes is a set of broker nodes. And broker nodes basically, they know what pieces of data live where on the cluster. So they become sort of the endpoint that you query and they will forward your queries down to the rest of the Druid cluster. And the rest of the Druid cluster will compute their pieces of information in parallel and return results to the broker nodes, which then return to the caller. So real-time nodes, historical nodes, and broker nodes all share the same query API. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, broker nodes, they encompass like the query scatter and gather functionality. And they also have a caching layer as well. And this can be like a local cache, like in your JVM heap, or it can be uh, a distributed cache, like you use memcache. Okay. So what data looks like in Druid. Um, if you recall, uh, I showed this data set a little bit earlier. It's supposed to represent an event. It's supposed to represent events as they're occurring on Wikipedia. Druid is fundamentally a column store. So it stores all your data in columns. And how it does that is basically we can look at the page dimension in this example here. And the page dimension has two values. It has Justin Bieber, it has Kesha. Uh, what we do with these values is we use a method called uh, dictionary encoding where we convert the actual string values to some integer ID. So in this case, Justin Bieber gets converted to zero, Kesha gets converted to one. Now, when we end up storing the page column, we only end up storing the integer representations of the values that are in that column. So we store zero, 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 indicating Justin Bieber was in the first three rows, and then one, 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 indicating Kesha was in the last three rows. Similarly, for the language column, uh, we only have a single value there, which is <coughs> English. So what we end up storing is basically just an array of zeros. And this is pretty common in column stores that, to do dictionary encoding because this representation that you have here is pretty, pretty easily compressed. So in Druid, we build a secondary index that helps us really narrow down on the data that we have to scan every time a filter is applied. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the page column again. And we're going to build an index that indicates basically which rows a certain value is seen. So if we look at the page column, we can see that Justin Bieber is seen in the first three rows, Kesha in the last three. So we can create basically a binary array that represents our data set, and one indicates that our value appeared, zero indicates that it doesn't. So Justin Bieber, in, in this particular case, appears in the first three rows, Kesha appears in the last three rows. So we, we have this binary array representation, and this binary array representation makes it very easy for us to figure out which rows a certain value is seen. How we end up using this is, let's say if we had a query where we only wanted to filter on those pages which contain Justin Bieber. 
So Justin Bieber in this particular in this particular data set appear, appears in the first three, the first two rows. So we only ever need to scan the first two rows. Kesha only appears in the last two rows. So when we issue a query, we we only need to scan the last two rows. Now, if we wanted to issue a query for pages that contain Justin Bieber or Kesha, then we can look at the two binary arrays associated with each value, and we can simply just order them together. And the resultant set will tell us which rows we have to scan. So um, if you're familiar with search engines at all, all, what we've built is basically an inverted index. So uh, on top of the binary arrays, we actually have an additional level of compression. And we use an algorithm that's called concise. Concise is really just a variation of a word align hybrid, which is really just a variation of uh, run length encoding. We simply chose concise because we thought the paper was pretty interesting and uh, it reported some really interesting numbers about the compression ratios that you can get. Um, oh, so what, one other thing I've got to mention is actually when we build our secondary indexes, when we build our inverted indices, we always operate with those inverted indices in their compressed form. So we actually never decompress when we do filters. Okay, so availability. Uh, some notes on availability here. Druid does replication. Um, because most of the data in Druid is immutable, actually replication becomes very easy. Uh, we also have a very simple uh, consistency model. Like, reconsistency becomes pretty simple when you're just dealing with immutable data. Um, so with replication, you lose a single node, no big deal. The cluster is sort of transparent to a single node outage. We kind of use that fact to our advantage in that uh, we, when we do software updates, we take a single node down, we update the software version, and then we do the next node, and so on and so on, and we actually can update an entire Druid cluster without taking any downtime, which is something that's, I think, pretty cool. And over, we've been doing that for about two years now, and we've never had any downtime in Druid for software upgrades. Um, Druid is designed to run on commodity hardware, so it's you know starting a uh, growing a Druid cluster. Sorry, is just a matter of starting up a Java process and then shrinking a, drop, uh, a Druid cluster. It takes a little bit more time, but essentially it's still a matter of just killing a Java process. Okay. Um, in the latest version of Druid, we are really trying to build Druid now as a platform. And the architecture is designed such that you can build modules on top of Druid and kind of just drop them in and then run them in, within the Druid atmosphere or the ecosystem. So people have actually contributed uh, complex metrics or complex aggregates on top of Druid. And they include things like cardinality estimation. So in that, uh, and that example dashboard I showed in the beginning, there was a visualization for the number of unique users. I can actually show you it again. Um, so this, this uh, number of unique users is actually running an algorithm called hyperlog log, uh, which is using like approximate algorithms to determine cardinality. So Druid really allows you to write like proprietary modules and your own proprietary algorithms. If you don't want to share them, share them with open source, that's cool. You can run them in-house. And Druid supports multiple modules of doing data ingestion. So Druid actually integrates with Storm. It integrates with Hadoop. And uh, we've been told that there's people out there working on integration of Druid with Spark, which is pretty cool. Um, Druid has a bunch of different node types, and it actually becomes pretty easy to build your own node types. You can just take existing modules and kind of put them all together and build a node out of that. And as I mentioned, uh, this is going to be available in Druid 06, which we're going to declare stable, I think, sometime this week. So. How we envision Druid kind of going forward is this platform in which different pieces can be built on top of, and you can get your data into Druid through different ways. 
Uh, what we do here at MetaMarkets is we do batch ingestion, batch loading of data uh, into Druid using Hadoop. We do streaming ingestion of data using Storm. So Druid does have a streaming component in the real-time nodes. However, we leverage Storm because it gives us the ability to do like ETL uh, with on top of like an event stream, which we think is extremely powerful. So Storm becomes the ETL layer, and then Druid is the thing that we use for aggregates, and it allows it allows like each piece to focus on what it's really good at. Um, some of the other things that we've built on top of Druid, uh, we've built approximate algorithms. So cardinality estimation, we've we've talked about and we've written about like approximate quantiles and approximate histograms. Also, uh, some approximate top K algorithms. We've built visualizations on top of Druid. The dashboard is sort of one example. Uh, when you have an engine that can do queries pretty fast, then you can provide your users with a pretty interactive experience. And uh, we've also built some machine learning components on top of Druid. Uh, this is sort of a very new area. Uh, we've built uh, actually a robust PCA component that does like spike detection uh, on top of data sets. So that's, if you're interested, we've written some blog posts on that. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, the community. So we open sourced Druid in Octo late October of 2012. So it's been a year and then some since Druid has been open sourced. Uh, the community has been growing steadily since that time. We have about 30 contributors now. And they represent a variety of different companies. And uh, Druid is in production at several companies already, and we're always hoping that more people can adopt it, which would be super cool. We provide support through an RC channel and also through community forums. And if you're interested in, in playing with Druid or like contributing anything back, that would make us really, really happy. So some benchmarks. Um, we benchmark Druid ingestion rate on top of real-world data as somewhere between 10 to 100,000 records per second per node. It's a very wide range, but uh, the ingestion latency is really variable on data complexity. So in an extremely simple data set, we can basically ingest, we benchmark as high as almost a million records uh, per second per node. Uh, but that's not really representative of real-world data. In real-world data, we've been told like 60,000, we've been told 20,000, so it kind of varies depending on how complex your data is. And uh, one of the, the benchmarks that actually Netflix, who's running Druid in production, shared with us is they're ingesting data at about 150,000 events per second, uh, which, is, which amounts to about 7 billion events per day. And that's about 500 megs per second, or about two terabytes of data per hour. So that's, that's pretty cool. Our scan rate. Um, the last last time we benchmarked Druid, uh, we benchmarked the scan rate about 33 million rows per second per node. Um, in that experiment, we actually spun up 100 nodes. Uh, that's supposed to say cores. I don't know why size cares. But uh, 100 nodes is about 1,600 cores and six terabytes of RAM, and we were able to do. 27 billion rows per second, which was um, which was pretty cool. So, some final takeaways: uh, Druid is good if you're looking for interactive, fast ex exploration of large amounts of data. Um, Druid might be useful to you if you're interested in analytics and you don't need just another key value store. Um, Druid is pretty good at doing low latency data ingestion, this concept of real-time streaming ingestion. And you know, you can use Druid if you need a data store or you need a, a, a platform that's always going to be available, and you need extensibility and flexibility with that data store. Where Druid is not good is if your data is small that it can fit in MySQL, uh, you should use MySQL because MySQL is awesome. If your data can fit in Excel, use Excel because Excel is even better. Um, unfortunately, most of the data we deal with cannot fit in those, uh, in those systems. So, uh, Druid is not particularly good for constant updates and deletes. So, if you're dealing with like very append-heavy data, it's great for that. If you're dealing with like data where you have to constantly update or delete different entries, 
it's not pretty really great for that. And if you're using Druid to query like individual entries or you're kind of doing lookups, that's not really what Druid is built for. It's built for aggregates. So uh, Druid is open source. We have a web page where you can just download and play with the system, try it out. Uh, we have a Twitter handle, which I'm, I'm learning all about Twitter and how to use Twitter. So we try and talk about the events that we're going to talk to, we're going to speak at, and like what we're up to on our Twitter handle. And of course, we have an RC channel if you're just ever interested in talking about the tech or if you need support. All right, that's all I had. Thank you all for listening. Cool. Cool. Yes. May we receive a copy of the slides? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they're actually online. Um, they're on Speaker Deck, I believe. I've, I've been to Deck. I also hope that they're there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we can post them in our, our Twitter handle, or we can, I think there's a copy on Speaker Deck already. So if you look for Druid in Speaker Deck, you'll find it. Cool. Um, questions? <coughs> oh, I think you were first. So what, oh, you mentioned earlier that um, you considered a lot of NoSQL alternatives and you found a fundamental problem with performance and that's been inside. Yeah. So uh, have you since gone back and looked at graph databases and uh, other alternatives like that? In memory graphs and stuff like that. So right now uh, we haven't, and sort of the main reason we haven't gone back to evaluate other solutions is we haven't felt that pain yet. Um, thus far, Druid has been working out pretty well for us, and it's been scaling pretty well with the large amount of data that we've been handling. If at some point this like system completely falls apart and there's like no way we can save it, then that's a uh, potential. Um, Right now, like we believe that we can probably scale out the system to, I guess, even larger data sets. And yeah, I mean, we've always talked about perhaps like benchmarking Druid more against like other existing systems out there. Uh, but we've we've found that the community actually has done some of that for us. So we're trying to push people that have benchmarked Druid to actually publicly share their results because I think that would be pretty interesting. <laughs> I think actually he was next. Yeah. Yes. Um. So when you say that it has, you know, it doesn't perform very well when you have updates and releases. Yes. So, because I'm curious, because I have a data set that up yes. until like 30 days, yes. it's slightly mutable. Yes. Like maybe 1% of it might have modifications. Mm. But then after that, it's never changes. Right. So is Druid able to handle something like that? Or? So Druid does handle updates, um, but the most of the data that we deal with in Druid is immutable. And how we handle an update is basically we rebuild like a block of data that contains the update. So we might have, let's say, so Druid's sharding model is uh, each block is called a segment. And if you're updating like a single row in a segment, you basically have to rebuild that entire segment. So it is able to handle it, but it's a matter of like how frequently that needs to occur. And what we do uh, typically at MetaMarkets is we have this real-time ingestion pipeline which might have like a few flaws here and there. And then maybe once a day or twice a day, we will rebuild like segments with that like cleans up, clean up the data. So we have a real-time process and we have like an accompanying batch process. If that makes sense. Yes. Yes. So you are next. You explained the, um, the compression and encoding of um, like string columns, like categorical yes. data. Yes. But there are also the numerics and the timestamp columns. Yes. Um, and if I remember from, from, uh, from your reading descriptions that the timestamp column is used for some citation purposes. Yes. Could you be able to describe a little more about those? So, sorry, the timestamp columns that were used? The timestamp column is used for some partitioning purpose, if I remember correctly? Right. So can, uh, can you, could you describe that? Right. Uh, so the question was about how timestamp columns are used for partitioning. And uh, so Druid's sharding model is it always shards by time first. And then it may additionally shard based on like dimensional cardinality. So if we have a data set that, for example, spans a week, um, our sharding model might be such that we build a segment that represents a day of data. And we use dictionary encoding for string columns. Um, the compression that we use sort of generically for all columns is LZF. Uh, we've been told, and we've done reading ourselves, that LZ4 is supposed to be sort of like the best thing. Uh, we, we, we haven't evaluated LZ4 versus Snappy yet, but it's something that we plan to do on our roadmap. 
Um, but yeah, the sharding model is always done by time, so we kind of pick a time range or a time granularity and we shard based on that. And if that segment is still too large, then we might do like an additional sharding based on some dimension. So if you're so if you have um, if yeah. you have n shards and you just and you're going to be basically putting in a year of data, is it going to eventually sort of be is it going to be wrapping around, mm -hmm. or, or is it be filling up more and more buckets each with, with some contiguous range of days? Uh, it, it'll, it'll be like the latter, basically. Yeah. So, like a certain, like let's say, for example, one day's worth of data might actually have like many shards associated, and we can keep adding sort of like buckets on there. Does that make sense? It, and it's uh, basically to add new buckets. You basically add new add new buckets as necessary. To, to yes. Okay. Exactly. Great. Yeah. Thanks. So yes. Yeah. So uh, so the, so it's an in-memory database, right? So I mean, like, how does it? How does the so I'm assuming the data gets backed up to disk or something like that, and then let's say you need to have like a, um, you know, like a hot standby or something like that. Are, there, are, are these things that, that, mm -hmm. that actually can be done? Or? Right. Um, so the question was uh, whether or not Druid is an in-memory database. Okay. And the answer to that is it really depends on the use case. So Druid actually has this concept of pluggable storage engines. Um, one of the storage engines that you can use is to store all your data in memory. We actually did that initially with Druid, sort of in its early days. But what we found was storing all your data in memory can be a little bit expensive. Uh, memory is not at the point where like, you can kind of just buy machines with tons of memory and just load all your data in there. So the storage engine that's actually default with Druid is it uses memory mapping. Mm. Right. So basically, like you have your data. When it gets queried, it's paged into memory, and it kind of resides there until the operating system decides to page it out. So for data that's accessed more frequently, it stays in memory. For data that's never queried, it just gets paged out until it's like needed again. And we found like it's a lot more cost efficient to use memory mapping. Cool. What about performance in this case? So the, I mean, once data is loaded in memory, I mean, like all data kind of needs to be loaded in memory before it can be scanned. So the real performance impacts are with the swapping cost of basically taking something from disk and then paging it into memory. Um, there is uh, definitely a cost associated there, but we found that with proper hardware, it can be mitigated. So for example, if you use SSDs, uh, which we do, then that swapping cost can be like heavily mitigated. But there is like definitely a uh, performance. If you issue like uh, a query for like a large amount of data, and that data is is so large that it requires like several passes of segments being paged into memory, then there could be some like performance degradations there. Have you quantified that in any way? Like all this cost, I mean, in terms of like memory is not a problem if you know right. how much has to be. Um, we have written up some literature about this. Uh, it's on the Druid IO website. It's on the blog where we talk about the performance impacts of purely in memory versus memory <coughs> mapped, and sort of the swapping costs that are associated. Yeah. If, you're, if you're interested, you can check it out. Yes. So, so basically, it's are you allowed to basically create sort of multiple tables in Druid? Because it seems like a denormalized yes. table scanning and aggregates. System, yes. Right? Yes. So yeah. Uh, Tables in Druid are just called data sources, and yeah. you can virtually create as many data sources as you want. Uh, Druid only deals with like denormalized data, so yeah. So just a follow up to what yes. you were mentioning. So, so since this needs to be backed up by SSD, like uh, so, you run on your own hardware, or can you run on Amazon? Or you can run on anything. I mean, um, we primarily run on Amazon, but we also have our own data center as well. Uh, so it's like it's designed to run on commodity hardware, so it's just a Java process. Yeah, if you run JVM, you're good. You're good to go. Hey, do you have any numbers on how much slower like setting up in an SSD environment versus regular drives are in comparison? Uh, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Like the numbers are really around like the rate at which you can kind of read data into memory. So we might have those numbers around in a document somewhere. I don't know if it's like actually public right sure. now, but it's significantly faster on SSDs. So follow up on that. Yeah. Um, is it 
no work to go all in memory or using the storage? Is it just a configuration? Yeah, it's something? it's everything is based on configuration. I mean, you can use the memory map model, and if you have enough memory to hold all your data in memory, then you're running entirely in memory. So the amount of memory you want to allocate on a machine is like purely configurable. So you're not fundamentally changing no. anything. No, it's it's just it's just tweaking configuration parameters when you when you start the node up. Yes. <coughs> How hard is uh, to add a new node to, to the cluster and is there a uh, performance of that? Yes. So the question was about the difficulty of adding a Druid node to the cluster. Uh, adding a node with a lot of distributed systems is all, like much simpler than removing a node. In Druid it's like near trivial. Basically you just start a Java process on some new hardware and Druid will take care of, like there's pieces of Druid which will take care of like moving data and like load balancing and then replicating data and everything accordingly. So it's a very simple process. The more, slightly more difficult process is if a node is lost, because if a node is lost, then there's some work to be done to like replicate data that was on that node and to redistribute data. So typically like losing a node is the more expensive process than adding a node. Like scaling up a cluster is pretty trivial. So, is load balancing automatic? Yes, yes it is. Yeah. The, uh, we actually, so we've built a sort of a co cost optimization matrix for load balancing. It's, it's pretty interesting because we've noticed that not all pieces of data are equal. Uh, data that's more recent tends to be queried a lot more than data that's like old. So we've kind of, we've taken that into account into our, our load balancing, so interesting. Cool, yes. Uh, so just to go back on the you know the storage and engine configuration stuff. Yes. Uh, so I just want to verify that this is possible. Yes. So if you frequently want to query, say, a very large data set. Yes. And you know, you would not you don't really care about keeping it around the memory for you know later payback. Sure. Fast access. Sure. Is that something that is relatively easy to set up? So, you know, right. Um, so what data gets paged in and out of memory, right now, it, we kind of just leave it to the operating system. Yeah, and it's, it's really dependent on the queries that we see. Yeah, so it's not like we force something to get paged out of memory. Like, if nothing queries that and like other things are getting queried, then some piece of data would just naturally get paged out. What are the time allocations for paging up data? Um, can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by time allocation? So, so do you have the ability to customize that yourself, or is it based on that? Oh, no, it's, uh, well? right, so yeah. we don't control sort of the paging. It's purely dependent on the operating system. It's something we could potentially do in the future, but we haven't invested the time to do so right now. You mentioned something earlier, too, about if the uh, nodes fail, there can be a problem with that. So my question would be, what, so, is the round robin defined in this process? Um, no, so actually, so actually what I mentioned before is the process of scaling down a cluster uh, tends to be more, a little bit more difficult than scaling up a process, uh, scaling up a cluster. Like scaling up a cl cluster is pretty trivial because you're just adding nodes. Scaling down a cluster, if you scale down too fast, like if you remove 10 nodes at once, right? Depending on your replication level, there is a chance that like data is actually lost. So um, the speed at which you can scale down a cluster is I think more dependent on configuration and like sort of how much tolerance to failure that you, you want to have. Does that help answer your question? That makes sense. Okay. Cool, yes. So when you have uh, something, when you basically remove nodes from a cluster, is the yes. partition is a rebalancing of that data automatic? Yes, automatic. It's purely automatic. Like you don't really have to worry about it. And can you query it to see its state? You know? Yes. Yeah. So you, there's endpoints that are exposed where you can query to see like how much a certain data source or how much a certain table is replicated or if it's like fully loaded and whatnot. So uh, in Druid, actually, the assignment has precedence over like replication. So if some data source is not fully loaded, it will it will try and assign any missing data before it goes to replicate data. So there, there is some intelligence in the load balancing and the assignment there. Yes? Were, were there any um, 
system changes uh, that we couldn't handle in a Roman fashion. And it sounds like with pluggable storage, uh, <laughs> you, you could probably even like, like change your, your storage. Yeah, you can. You could change your storage uh, notion to tune your system. But yeah. Have the, have the internal communication protocols been solid for two years then? Yes. So, um, Druid is completely architected such that like we had this belief that like downtime is evil and everything that we do is for this reason that like we never want to experience downtime. So we don't want to experience downtime for for restarts. We don't want to experience downtime for like software upgrades. So every piece of the Druid cluster is designed to, such that it could be like updated in a rolling fashion. Yeah. So we've yeah our intra cluster communication, all communication in the cluster, all pieces of that cluster are designed such that they can be updated in a rolling fashion. With, you know, something like, like versioning then? It's, yeah, so like, yeah, so I mean, Druid software deployments have a concept of a version, and um, when we do software updates, we typically make it such that like every version is backwards compatible. Right. Um, and typically, we'll, we'll often see like a mixture of versions in like a real production Druid cluster. And it's designed to operate that way. Yes. What is the future of, of, of the next few releases that you see uh, in, more in terms of the analytic capabilities that you have? Right. Uh, so there are a set of like approximate algorithms that we've built in-house. Uh, we've thus like, kept proprietary uh, because they relate directly to our core business. Um, we hope to, in the near future, be able to open source a little bit more of the analytic features. Um, in terms of Druid development in the next little while, we really want to tackle this problem of scaling Druid across multiple data centers, uh, which is something we're looking at right now. Not just to have mostly on Amazon, but to have a mixture of Amazon our own data centers and potentially value different data centers for, for cost purposes. Uh, we're also looking at the ingestion pipeline of Druid, um, making improvements there, reducing the latency. And by reducing the latency and reducing some of that work, it will actually open up possibilities for different query types. It's, it's a little bit more detailed than I could probably have time to get into right now, but we can discuss that offline if you're interested. Um, I'm actually writing something up right now, which I want to announce to the community about like the set of features we're concerning with Druid. So yeah, there's, there's, we have no shortage of things that we want to build. I suppose yes. this, this would be a detailed question for, kind of following on to that. Yeah. Um, if, um, um, a colleague of mine did some, did some, did some looking, and it looked like there wasn't any. I mean, different event streams are going to have different attributes. Yes. So at some point, you know, either before or after aggregating, it's yes. kind of common to want to join. Yes. We found it was kind of a there was a barrier there. Yes. Where, um, where it's sort of like, hey, you got to roll your own. Is there any? Yes. Uh, um, is, is that anywhere on your roadmap? Yes. So absolutely. That's uh, so Druid actually right now does not support joins. But uh, what we do is we actually use Storm to do joins. So we use Storm Hadoop as basically our ETL layer. And um, we are actually trying to build and talk about more of how Druid and Storm can work together. So we do, we do sort of like this, we, we do like real-time joins in Storm and then a single feed that, that feeds into Druid. In terms of like queries that incorporate joins, that's something we've talked about, but it's probably a little bit more work um, for the use case that that we, for the use cases that we typically deal with. We found like doing joins at the at the ETL layer is sufficient. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, yes. One last question. Yes. Because you were talking about that sort of replication on the real time nodes. Are they also paged out? So basically, if a real-time node has data streaming in goes yes. down, do you lose data? So uh, the real-time nodes have, so the question was about uh, real-time node availability. Um, the real-time nodes have HPA characteristics built in as well. Um, at a high level, you can basically replicate data across, across real-time nodes. So if you lose a single node, no big deal, your data is like replicated. The we have like best practices of using real-time nodes. Like typically, we actually have Kafka that sits in front of the real-time nodes. And what Kafka allows you to do is one, it's like a central message bus in which like events go in, right? So you can have multiple nodes read from the same message bus. That's how you get replication. The other thing that Kafka supports is this concept of like offsetting. So you can basically commit um, some offset into Kafka, 
and you can reread from that offset. Uh, so what real-time nodes actually do, which I didn't go into too much detail about here, is they actually periodic, periodically persist data they've collected to disk. Like they actually have an indexing component well, where, where they will build like the column representation that's used in Druid like every few minutes. And every time they persist the disk, they actually commit an offset back to Kafka. So what this means is if a node fails and recovers and it doesn't lose disk, then it can immediately reload all the indexes it has persisted and then look at the last offset it committed and only begin reading events from that offset. So the recovery time is typically pretty fast. So that combined with replication um, in sort of a production setting has been like good enough for us. Yeah, if you're interested, I can go into more detail, but the real-time nodes have a, a ton of like HA built in because of like the fact that it's dealing with streaming data. Cool. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, there's more Great pizza and beer. Also do that with a system like HBase as well. Uh, there's like Druid is it's not like Impala or it's not like uh, Hive. It's not like something that sits really on top of HDFS. It mainly like leverages the storage capabilities of HDFS or like HBase. Um, the reason we kind of do that is we just believe that we can get faster for these nodes. Uh, like we pull the data, and, and, like we build data and use the natives to it indexes, then we pull it out and it out, and that's the data that we scan over. And we just find that it's like much faster than trying to like build a query and Okay, it's an intermediate data store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 